good morning, church. And happy new year to all of you this morning. Great to be with you. My friends, today we're going to start a two-week short series where we're going to be looking through the second chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. So if you haven't done so already, please get your Bibles out to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking through verses 1 to 11. And let me pray for us as you do so. Lord, we come before you this day, a new year, Lord, to love, to serve you, to look to your word, Jesus. I pray, Lord, as we look to the scriptures this day, that you'd give us understanding, guide us by your spirit, give us wisdom, Lord. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts here present would be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We lift this time up to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, so Paul's letter to the Philippians, what I'm going to do quickly is walk us through just some brief context before we dive into chapter 2 this morning. In Philippians, friends, we see the centrality of the gospel message on display. The good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is central to Paul's letter here to the church in Philippi. If you look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, you'll see Paul's audience, right? The saints and the church leaders in Philippi. And in chapter 1, verse 6, specifically, we hear that verse that brings great comfort to the true believer, that he, God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion. Hear that word of assurance this New Year's Day. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Moving forward in chapter 1, verses 12 to 18, Paul mentions those who preach Christ out of selfish ambition. And in verses 19 to 30, Paul states to live as Christ, to die as gain. Paul speaks of his deep desire to depart and to be with Christ, but for him to remain in the flesh is more necessary for the saints. And so we see that selfless mode of Christ in the Apostle Paul. Paul continues forward and he calls the saints in Philippi to let their manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. He speaks of believers being of one mind and one spirit, as well as believing in and suffering for Christ. Now throughout the letter, friends, we encounter many other themes, and I encourage you this week to read through Philippians. It'll take you about 20 minutes. So with that, let us dive into our text before us this day. Again, Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. Let's look at verses 1 to 2. Scripture says this, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. So in chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, Paul speaks with this if-then sort of structure. Essentially, here's the idea. Is there any encouragement in Christ? The answer, yes. Is there any comfort from love? Yes. Is there any participation in the Spirit? Yes. Is there any affection and sympathy? Yes. These blessings of the gospel, Paul lays out here in verse 1. And so these blessings of the gospel should then lead us as believers to a yes of a shared mindset. Look at verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. So St. Paul starts to lay out this idea of this unified gospel mindset, right? This unity in the church, this mindset, friends, that we will see in our text is ultimately modeled after Christ's mind, right? The mindset of Christ, the love of Christ, we will see that. So a unified gospel mindset, that's the first thing we want to look at here. We're encouraged, friends. We're encouraged and comforted because 
Christ loves us because we have fellowship because of Christ's work. And so now Paul is calling us to this unified mindset, right? That all of us, as the body of Christ, as the church, we should have the same ultimate goal and the same purpose in the gospel, this unity, right? This unified mindset. And so that's the goal, friends, that we would continue to be unified in our mindset here at St. George's, that this year, this 2023, this new year, that the gospel would go forth from our church in a powerful way. And that when we're of the same mind in the gospel, we can experience that fullness of joy in Christ. And so you see these blessings of the gospel in verses 1 to 2. Now, friends, the world, the world is full of promises for comfort and joy, for fellowship and love. But the kind of comfort, joy, and love that the world offers will never leave you feeling satisfied. Instead, Jesus, the light of the world, offers you true encouragement, true comfort, true love, true fellowship, true affection and sympathy, joy and unity. So we believe in him, gain the forgiveness of our sins, eternal life, and the loving fellowship of his church. Jesus is the one who your soul has always longed for. And so Jesus will fulfill your deepest desire. And all of these blessings that we see in verses 1 to 2 will come to you in him. Look at verses 3 to 4 now. Paul moves forward with this gospel mindset, this unified mindset. Verse 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So again, in verses 3 to 4, we see the picture of what Paul's doing. He's continuing this, what does this unified mindset look like? What's this attitude for the believer? Right, This one mind that that we'd have understanding and be focused on the same purpose in the gospel. So Paul continues with this, and in verse 3, he calls us away from selfish ambition, right? Selfish ambition or conceit, vainglory, or any form of pride, right? He's calling us away from that, and St. Paul's calling us to humility and service that's rooted at its core in the gospel, So Paul calls us to this humility, verses 3 and 4. Ultimately, friends, that we check our hearts that we would not aim to lift ourselves up above others in pride, but that we would be lowly in our conduct, right? That we'd be concerned for the needs of others, right? Look at verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That we would... As Christians, as true believers in Jesus Christ, that we would live this life of service. This life of service, not not a life of prideful competition, but a life of service, right? A servant's life that we're called to live that is modeled after the life of the Savior. We're going to see this as we move through the text. This life of service. Well, friends, Oh, how this differs from the message of the secular world, doesn't it? You know, I was thinking about verse 3. I was thinking about this idea of, of selfish ambition that so characterizes our world in many ways. Now, firstly, important for us to note, when Paul's using this term that's translated selfish ambition, what he's speaking of in the immediate context is back in chapter 1, verse 17, He's talking about those who preach Christ out of selfish ambition, right? Which, of course, in many ways is quite prevalent in the modern church. But, friends, it being New Year's Day, I wanted to apply this concept of selfish ambition to the idea of New Year's resolutions and goal setting. Now, personally, I love setting goals. 
I love praying about what's next vocationally for me, the impact I want to make, the growth, the learning that I'd like to accomplish. Of course, friends, knowing that nothing will be accomplished unless the Lord wills that anything will be accomplished. So you must always take a prayerful approach, of course, to goals and adjust as needed as the Lord guides you through the year. But in general, I think it's a great idea to have a general direction and to make improvements and adjustments as needed, right? Aiming at something, making daily progress towards that end. These are good disciplines. But what I find myself reflecting on this year, this New Year's Day, with this text before me is, how many of my goals or motives are rooted in selfish ambition? Again, many goals may be good things, right? Maybe that's a new Bible in a year reading plan or Bible in two years reading plan or you want to read a certain amount of books, you'd like to learn a new skill, you'd like to grow your business so that you can support your family, you'd like to make a bigger impact in your workplace. These aren't bad things. But the question is, and I think that's where the heart check moment comes in this day with this text, how many of our goals or resolutions are purely rooted in selfish ambition? Now, I'm going to try to keep this in view as I look to write goals and resolutions this year. And so you see what Paul's calling us to then. Do nothing. You see the high call there? Do nothing from selfish ambition. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so the question for us today on New Year's Day, start of 2023, do we count others more significant than ourselves? Do we actually look to the interests of others? Right? Do, do we have the goal to, to grow in obedience to Christ this year, being in Christ by grace through faith? Are we now zealous to walk in obedience and in good works? Titus 2, right? Things that would benefit others. And so Paul calls us to this, to focus on others, right? So let us, church, this year, be ambitious for the gospel, right? Evangelizing that others would be saved. And let us walk in good works, actively pursuing Christ in obedience to the end that we would be serving others, right? Not looking to our own interests only, but also to the interests of others, Right? Not in selfish ambition or conceit. Not living pridefully, but living humbly. Maybe we need to reflect on passages like Matthew 25. Who are the hungry? Who's the stranger? Who's without clothing? Who's the sick? Who are the sick? Who are the imprisoned? Who are the least of these? in our community, in your families, in your friend groups? How can we serve others being ambitious for the gospel this year in a selfless way, following the way of the Savior? And so like Paul and the apostles, that we too would be disciples who are living with urgency, right? To share the gospel with others and to live a life of service and humility, and again, I'm preaching to myself, I want to find new ways to live a life worthy of the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not in selfish ambition, or maybe that looks like not actively pursuing certain hobbies or watching TV and Netflix instead, only, instead of only thinking about maybe our own careers. Let us instead actively pursue devotion to Christ obedience to Christ, serving others in humility. That's got to be the goal. And so then, how do we do this? How do, how do you do this in 2023 and beyond? Right, ultimately, friends, that we wouldn't just show up on a Sunday and say, love God, love your neighbor, but then six days a week live with selfish ambition at the core of our days. Well, how can we pursue obedience in this way that Paul's calling us to. Of course, friends, we know it's not a perfect walk in obedience. That's why we need a Savior. In fact, 
We could never obey God in any way that was pleasing to him before we were saved in Christ. We have to get that straight. It's not a perfect walk, but yet this is the call, and we're, we're called to actively work and grow as God is at work in us, that we, we would bear fruit, living lives of humility and service, right? Lively faith that bears fruit. Again, so how do we do this with this call to obedience? Well, verse 5, we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus. Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I like this quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says this. Someone asked him, well, how do I grow in humility? How do I grow in obedience in this way? How do I grow in humility? He said this. There's only one way to be humble, and that is to look into the face of Jesus Christ. You cannot be anything else when you see him. So you want to grow in obedience. You want to grow in humility and service to others. Well, you look to Jesus then, your humble Savior. Set your gaze upon him this year. Pursue him in devotion. Know him more and more. Obey him more and more. Be zealous for good works. Set your gaze on Jesus. Look at verse 5. This mind, right, this attitude, this mind, everything that Paul's been talking about here, this mind, this unified mindset of humility, love, and service, this mind is yours in Christ Jesus. You possess this mind, this attitude, this character. This is at the core of your new hearts in Jesus Christ. You're running on this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. Again, friends, you're running on this new heart, right? A faithful heart. God has removed your heart of stone. He's given you a heart of flesh, a faithful heart, an obedient heart. God has caused you to be born again, and he is finishing the good work that he started in you. And so he calls you to active obedience as he works within you, right? He is the cause and the one who completes your salvation, and you have this mind among yourselves because you're united to the Lord Jesus Christ, this mind, this attitude, this character of Christ is at the very core of your new heart, right? You you have a new capacity for this life of humble service because you've been saved in Jesus Christ. This life of obedience. Now, of course, friends, we know the flesh is still battling, right? Right? But don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit who now lives in you. And so again, our obedience in this, what Paul's calling us to, this humble service, again, it will not be perfect. We know this. We must continually rely on the Savior because without him, we're doomed. But nonetheless, there's this high call to live out the reality of who we actually are in Jesus Christ, by his grace. And so this example of what Paul is calling us to is found in Christ, and we'll see this as we move through the rest of the text. So yes, Christ is the supreme example of humility, but Christ is not only an example. First and foremost, he is our Lord and Savior. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Christ brought us to life. Salvation is his work through and through. And now, only being in Christ, now follow his lead and live a holy life of humility and service. We've been saved by God's grace alone. We've been given the gift of saving faith. And this faith, my friends, this faith that justifies is a lively faith. It's a living faith. It's not a dead faith. As Martin Luther, he said this, we're justified by faith alone, 
but not by a faith that is alone. True faith, and what Luther was talking about in this quote, saving faith will bear true fruit because we're connected to the true vine, Jesus Christ. So we will bear fruit. The faith that justifies is not dead faith, it's living. And so Paul calls us to obedience. Specifically, this obedience here, humility and service, right? In fact, we must recover the proper theology when it comes to obedience, when it comes to good works and humility and service. We know none of us can merit salvation by our own works. We know this. This is clear. It's only through the finished work of Christ that salvation comes to us. But our obedience, the fruit, the good works, these are evidences and proof of our secure salvation in Christ, of our already secure salvation. We've been saved in Christ and we will now bear fruit in obedience. In this obedience, this life of humble service. And so you're in Christ. And because of that reality, you have this mind among you. This unified gospel mindset. This mind of humble service in obedience to Christ. You, because you are in Christ, now have the capacity to grow in imitating Christ's example of humility. Because at the core of your identity is Christ who by his spirit is at work in you. And so we ask ourselves the question. A few questions. Well, this year then, what choices does Christ desire me to make? What things does he want me to pursue as he lives within me? You ever meditate on that reality? Christ lives in you by his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity residing in you, the God of the universe. And so he will surely work within you as he finishes the work that he started in you. You will bear fruit. And so verse 5, this mind was also in Christ. We follow him as example. But this mind is first and foremost yours in Christ, right? You possess this mind because Jesus has saved you by his grace and you're being conformed to his image. And so, yes, he is example, but first and foremost, he is savior. Realize that you're saved by grace alone and now pursue obedience for Christ. This life of humility and service. And so, let's look at verses 6 to 7 as we move through here. Verse 6 to 7. The Son of God takes on flesh. We start to see where Paul's been going with this unified mindset. Verse 6. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born, in the likeness of men. The Son of God takes on flesh. This is the ultimate act of humility. Remember, friends, even in our obedience, even in our best efforts, our best efforts are filthy rags, and yet we strive, pressing on, growing in humble obedience, relying on our Savior, Because Christ's finished work has been sufficient. Verse 6, the word became flesh. So verse 6, we see Christ who is our humble Savior. Right? A servant who came to save. This part in the text from verses 6 forward is what's called the Christ hymn. Here we see, friends, how Christ made himself low. Right? Do you see what Paul's been framing this whole time? This life of 
humility and service, looking to the interests of others. This is all ultimately found in Jesus Christ. This is the whole point of this passage. So we see how Christ has made himself low. And in verses 9 to 11, how God raised him up high. Jesus was perfectly free of selfish ambition. Right? He was perfectly free of selfish ambition and empty conceit. And he was perfectly full of humility and perfectly full of love. In verse 6, a couple key theological points. Verse 6, the Son of God is equal to God. The Son of God is equal to God. Here we see the divinity and deity of Jesus as fully God. Verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So this form here referring to the underlying reality that Jesus is fully divine. And at the end of verse 6, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Or another translation, he thought it not robbery. Now think of this, friends. Think back to the garden. Unlike Adam and Eve who grasped at the fruit in the garden, wanting to be like God in a prideful way, Christ already knew who he was. He's fully God. Something desirable was already possessed by Christ. His divinity, his equality with God. Do you see that in verse 6? But here's the example of our humble Savior. Christ did not exploit this reality for personal gain. No, Christ is humble and selfless. Instead, he emptied himself. Verse 7. This is important. He emptied himself means that the Son of God took on a human nature in humility. This is the ultimate act of humility. Our humble Savior. The Son of God takes on a human nature in humility. And again, important to note, he did not surrender any of his divine attributes. This phrase that he emptied himself means that he humbled himself, right? He took on the form of a servant. Verse 7. Embracing dishonor by becoming man. So the Son of God takes on a human nature. And again, very important for us to get right. As a man, Jesus continued to possess his glory and he revealed it to his disciples from time to time, right? Remember the transfiguration, for example. But this is the point. He, he came down in humility, right? He deprived himself of the full enjoyment of the glory befitting to his divine status and identity for a time. He, ga- he came down from his throne for us. Do you see that mindset of Christ? This is the mindset of humility. Okay, so Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's one person, two natures. He's fully human yet sinless. He's the God-man. He's fully divine, yet veiled in flesh. All right. So what do we do with all of this? How do, how do these theological truths apply to our lives? Again, friends, let us follow Jesus, who is our Savior, who came to serve by taking the form of a servant, who came to serve and to save. Again, remember, at the core of your new heart in Christ is the very life, death, and resurrection that's at work within you. The character of the humble Savior is at work within you. This mind is yours in Christ, right? This this life of humility, this life of servanthood, these are core aspects of of our new identities in Christ. And so, then we must live them out. How do we do that? Again, we press into the Savior. We gaze upon the Savior. We look in the face of Jesus Christ and we will be humble. We press into God's word and devotion and prayer this year that we continue to be humbled as we grow in service to others in the church and beyond. 
right? This capacity, this capacity is within you because of what Christ has done for you. So you continue to look to Jesus and you will continue to be more and more humble. So this whole point that Paul's making, Christ is humble. He's not prideful, right? He emptied himself. He humbled himself by taking on the form of a slave. Again, not by subtracting his deity, but by adding humanity, assuming a human nature, one person, two natures. Look at verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What we see, friends, the word became flesh. God went all the way down. God went all the way down, taking on all of human sin and pain and distress and agony. Christ came to earth so that the earthly could become heavenly, right? The Son of God became man so that men could become sons of God. God took on human flesh that we humans could partake of the divine life, right? The King of heaven has made us citizens of heaven. This is good news. Look at verse 8. Being found in human form. Right? Christ takes on all the properties of humanity, but without sin. For example, he was hungry, he was thirsty, he grew, etc. And here's the key point in verse 8. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Right? As a man obedient to the will of God, right? Being found in human form, he's obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The incarnate Christ on earth, obedient to the Father's will for us. He is our humble Savior. So, the cross then is the measure of Jesus' humility, right? The lengths in which he was willing to go in obedience to his Father for us. And now we too, living lives that are powered by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we too must pick up our crosses daily, taking suffering and even death head on, obeying the will of our Heavenly Father in response to what Jesus has done for us. Our human will is obedient to the will of God. Remember this, friend. God took on human flesh for you. For you. That through faith in Christ, you would now have an unshakable heavenly foundation for your life. Eternal life to come and inexpressible joy now. Even through trial, even through pain and suffering, nothing can shake you Because you were bought with a price. Your life is founded on the humble Savior. Your hearts are running on this reality, this mind that is yours in Christ. Nothing can shake you because the Word became flesh and the Spirit lives within you. And so Jesus then, Jesus is the model of this low-minded humility, right, that Paul had called for in Philippians 2, verse 3. Now think of it, friends. A proud person would protest that some low position was beneath them. But Jesus displays his true humility by not regarding anything beneath him. Do you see that there? He'll die for you. And he did. Christ did not even regard himself above death. Even the most cruel, most shameful, painful death, the cross, the crucifixion, right? And friends, as if the suffering of the cross wasn't enough, Jesus' suffering on the cross is unequaled because he bore the curse of sin. He suffered the awful wrath of God as an atoning substitute and sacrifice. Important for us to note, friends, We could never bear this wrath on a cross. Without Jesus, we would be bearing this wrath for all of eternity in hell. 
That's the just wrath of God due to human sin. But Jesus, the God-man, was able to bear the wrath of God on the cross because he is fully God and fully man. The God-man bore the curse of sin and the wrath of God on behalf of his sheep as their substitute. Right, The penalty that was due to his sheep, he paid for in full. His sheep who are dispersed throughout the whole world. All right. So Christ humbled himself. He takes on a low estate. He doesn't appear in splendor, but he appears in humility, right? He lives the perfect life of obedience that we couldn't live. He dies the death that we deserved. He satisfies the wrath of God. He offers us the forgiveness of sins, his perfect righteousness, and eternal life through faith. What else do you need? As I've said before, I'll say it again. If you have Jesus, you have everything. You possess this mind, which is yours in Christ. You possess all things in Jesus Christ. My friends, the world promises you happiness and joy that's fleeting at best. But the word of God, Jesus, promises you eternal happiness inexpressible heavenly joy my friends believe your life will never be the same i know this friends before i was saved i was studying psychology and world religions hinduism buddhism taoism shinto islam multiple philosophies i dabbled in the new age in yoga all kinds of things like this in Eastern spirituality. But what I realized, friends, all of, most of the other world religions promise you this sort of enlightenment. But you'll never achieve it no matter how much meditation you do. But when you encounter the light of the world, everything changes. His name is Jesus. He'll change your life and bring you to eternity through faith. It was only when I encountered Jesus that everything changed. Logically consistent, historically accurate, and eternally true is Christianity. Because it's based on the most influential person who ever walked the face of the earth and rose from the grave in victory. His name's Jesus. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life, and he is our humble Savior. And you know what else he is? He's Lord. Look at verses 9 to 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's Lord. Verse 9, God has highly exalted him. This is in direct response to the incarnate Christ's obedience on earth. And so we see here in these verses, Christ is restored to that glorious heavenly status that he had in the beginning, right? The status that he did not exercise for a time as a human servant on earth the god man is lord all creation will acknowledge his lordship and paul alludes to a passage in isaiah 45 and paul takes something that can only be true of yahweh the lord god and he breathtakingly applies it to jesus to me every knee shall bow every tongue shall swear allegiance Isaiah 45, 23. And so we see the exaltation now of Christ's human nature and the restoration of the glorious, exalted status of his divine nature. You hear the deep truth, friends. The word became flesh for you. The son of God became man that men might become sons of God, right? The heavenly came down to save us, that we humans would be made citizens of heaven through faith. 
in Christ. That's an eternal foundation for your life. My friends, again, all of the other religions and philosophies in the world, they tell of man's search for God. But Christianity speaks of God's relentless pursuit of man. Christ, the humble Savior, the Word becomes flesh. Jesus, the glorious Son of God, fully divine, took on flesh, became also fully man. Divinity and humanity meeting in the person of Jesus. And now because of his work on the cross, we too may be exalted to the heavens, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, the name above every name, Jesus is Lord. All will bow to him. No sphere of creation will be exempt. Some will bow in belief. Some will bow in defeat. Jesus is Lord. So then, church, this year, this 2023, let us live under his lordship in all things. We've preached this multiple times. Not living secular lives that are governed by secular values, but living spiritual lives governed by heavenly values. We're citizens of heaven, aren't we? Jesus is our Lord. The heavenly king is at work within us. And we're bearers of God's image. Well then, our lives should not look like a picture of secular living. Our lives should be a picture of Christ, of Christ's life, the humble Savior. And so then let us live lives that are drastically different, right? That people would look at our lives and see Jesus in our words and in our actions. So my friends, this New Year's Day, we stand in awe as we meditate on the self-giving love of God seen in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us rejoice in our humble Savior, he who loved us and gave himself for us. Right? God is a giver. He's not a grasper. He, that, that giving and serving in humility describes the character of Christ. This is what Paul has been laying out for us here. So then... Let us live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let us grow in obedience, being zealous for good works, giving and serving, looking to the interests of others in humility. Let us grow in devotion to Christ this year and bear fruit. And as J.C. Ryle said, we were placed here to train for eternity. Well, let's ask ourselves the question, how's the training going? Let us imitate Christ, our Savior, who's at work within us by his grace. Christ lives in us by his spirit. So let it be our goal in life, to be holy as he is holy, relying on his grace. So let us press on with urgency, actively striving, and let us give and serve like Christ, who is our humble savior. My friends, this is the story of Christmas. God has been humble. How could we ever be proud? Let us share in the mind of Christ, which is ours in Christ, as we, go, as we cultivate gospel humility this new year. Because the one who was high above came low to save us. So let us do nothing from selfish ambition. Instead, let us follow Jesus, our humble Savior, having this mind among ourselves, which is ours in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the truth of who you are, Jesus. This year, Lord, work in us that we live out this life of humble service, growing in obedience, Lord, always relying on you, Lord, knowing that we're only in the position that we're in because you God, have caused us to be born again, and you will finish the good work that you started in us. Let us press into that assurance. Let us look to the face of Jesus, and let us be humbled. In your name we pray. Amen.